morning. We are going to actually be all over the place this morning. But I am grateful for how things have worked out to be able to speak this message because, you know, there's, there's no greater thing to know than that God has a plan of salvation. There's no greater thing to know. And if you've come to understand the sinfulness and the state spiritually in which you were born, then you understand what I'm talking about. Like that's, it's special to know that God has a plan for saving humanity. Um, but also on top of that, it's a blessing to think about that as I'm teaching you and helping to equip you that you're going to go out of this building and you're going to talk about it. And you're going to look for opportunities to share the gospel because Sometimes we think, man, I'm doing pretty good as a Christian, but we don't realize that a Christian is a little Christ. And so it's really not, sometimes these days we come to think of good Christians as those who just go to the church building, they're faithful, they give some money, they do these different things, and all that's a part of it, not minimizing that, right? I don't, don't take it the wrong way, but being a Christian is about being like Christ. And one of the things Christ did is he went everywhere preaching the gospel of the kingdom. And so this is, uh, this is a big part of our mission. And so what we believe, God's calling us to take it outside of these walls into the dark world, into those people that are dead and lost who desperately need it. And so it just reminds me of the potential that you all have. And it's encouraging to think that somebody would leave here today with a greater commitment to go out there and make a difference with the gospel. Because we're starting a series today entitled Breaking Down the Mission. Breaking Down the the mission. I don't know how many parts there are to this because I know without a doubt I'm not getting through all of the message for today. But we want to just break this thing down. And what again is the mission? Well, if you want to know, if you want to make a note, what is the mission? The mission is found in Matthew 28 verses 18 through 20. And there's a command there right in the center of those verses. And the command is to make disciples. That is the one command in those in, that, in those verses that God has given, that is our mission, to make disciples, and specifically to make disciples of Jesus Christ. Does anybody know what is a disciple? You should know because I've defined it probably a hundred times from this pulpit and other places, but what is a disciple? Well, a disciple itself is a learner, okay? But if you understand a disciple in Jesus' day and in that culture, what you would find is it a little more than just, just a learner. But it was referring to one who was a committed, lifelong learner and follower. So write, down, write that down so you don't forget it. What is a disciple? It refers to a committed, lifelong learner and follower of something or someone. In Jesus' day, there were rabbis, there were teachers, right? And so it meant to be a committed, lifelong learner and follower of that rabbi. And so the aim that we have, the mission we've been given, is to build disciples who will be lifelong, committed learners and followers of, guess who? Sunday school answer. Jesus. There you go. That's what it's all about. Because as people learn to follow Jesus, as they learn to tap in to the way he thinks, then supernaturally their lives are going to begin in the world to reflect his character. More and more they're going to be conformed into his Im image, and that is our mission. So today we want to focus in on some of the various tasks that are involved in this one mission to make disciples, okay? Okay. And yes, a big part of that happens in this building, in this room, in the meeting, but I'm telling you, the majority of it should be happening out there. And if it's not happening out there, then you as a believer should be looking at yourself, examining yourself, and saying, what is wrong with me that I am not seeking to fulfill the mission of God? So today, the part we're going to focus in on is called evangelism. That's what we're going to talk about. That's the one task that it takes to make a disciple of Jesus Christ. So what is evangelism? Well, the word itself just simply means to proclaim good news. Well, in the case of a believer, we are proclaiming the good news specifically of, again, what's the Sunday school answer? Of Jesus Christ. We are declaring the good news of God's kingdom. We are declaring that God has a plan for saving 
dead and lost humanity. That's what we have the opportunity to proclaim to the world. Are you sharing the good news? Are you sharing your story? Are you sharing with lost people what God has done for you? Are you sharing with others how they can move from not having a relationship with God to moving into a relationship with God? That is a part of our mission. Are you prepared? I realize it is God who's given leaders and others, teachers to prepare you and to equip you. And so we're going to do that this morning. And I can challenge you all day long to take notes and do all those other things. But I promise you, if you don't engage in some way through doing that, then you're going to leave here and you're going to forget everything I'm saying. And yeah, you're going to be able to tell everybody you went to church and you're going to feel good about yourself, but you're not going to be any more prepared to go out there and make a difference than you are right now if you don't somehow figure out a way to engage other people and be equipped to do so. So God, I believe, in the midst of we live in a time where over the years, man has tried to come up with all kinds of different tools and ways to teach others how to share the gospel. But I discovered several years ago that God has already placed in his word, in his word the greatest tool to teach us how to share the gospel. You know what that is? It's the tabernacle. It really is. And I'm not saying you have to walk up to somebody and say, hey, let me break out my, my picture of the tabernacle and let me share. I'm not saying that. But I want you to look at your bulletin. I don't have mine. Let me find mine. So I had our secretary put, a, put, a, put some pictures on here for you. At the front of your bulletin, you get this outside view. Looks like a bit of a crazy little thing, right? I've actually, in Israel, when I went with Roger here back, several years ago we went to a a replica of this thing like literally out in the middle of nowhere and it was really cool to go there and and see this but not only that to have the lady that was there that has was responsible for I guess overseeing it to walk us through it and to talk about how ultimately all this pointed to Christ what an amazing blessing that was I think we've got it on some tape somewhere I need to find that for you But anyway, you've got a picture of the outside, but I want you to also flip on the back of your bulletin. And I want you to turn it to where it's horizontal like this and where you've got sermon notes over here on the right side. And this this basically is an overhead view of the tabernacle. And so I'm going to go ahead and share with you this morning. This is a very simple, basic presentation, okay? Like any of you who've ever studied this, and you've looked into this, you know that man, I spent literally on Wednesday nights, I don't know guys how long, I mean, it was a year and a half, possibly two years talking about this thing. So this is going to be just a very basic thing, hopefully just kind of get your mind engaged and realize. So I want you to, I want you to just take a minute and stare at your bulletin, this view for just a minute. Just stare at it, look at it, just for maybe 30 seconds. This view right here, the one on the back, the overhead view. All right, y'all young boys up in the top back there, I don't see y'all listening. Y'all not looking? Let me get y'all a bulletin. All right. All right, so stare at it for 30 minutes, all right? 30 minutes, not 30 minutes, 30 seconds. I don't have to stare at it for 30 seconds because this is in in what's the word? indelibly I can't even speak this morning it's etched in my mind like if you said hey Matt draw the tabernacle I'm like on it just you know I spent so much time in it now here's what I want you to do I want you to put your bulletin aside close your eyes just close your eyes D- deal bear with me okay I know some of you hard-headed men you can't do it because you just like doing your way but close your eyes for a sec can you see it you stared at it for 30 seconds. Can you see it? You should be able to see it. You just got an image of this little box, this horizontal box. You've got this little thing here, this little thing there, and then another small box inside that box. You see it? All right, open your eyes. Again, I don't want you to take me wrong on this. I think this is something that God has given us that we can see, that we can have in our minds, but yet The person we're sharing with never even knows we're talking about the tabernacle. But I want you to understand something. This thing enables you to walk somebody who's on the outside. 
who is not in a relationship with God to walk them basically through this entire thing to a special place. Look on your bulletin. This little box inside the big box, that's the tabernacle. You see the little box inside right here? Or if you're looking on the front, you see the little little box on top there that has like the, the, the tents and stuff coming down on the side? That's actually the tabernacle. Now that's, that's a special place. You know why it's special? Because inside this tabernacle complaint contained a compartment known as the Holy of Holies. Ever heard of the Holy of Holies? Do you know what's significant about the Holy of Holies? Yes. It's God's presence. It's his presence. See, the plan of salvation is all, it's all about you walking somebody who is not in a relationship with God. It's walking them through God's plan of how you can now have a relationship with God, how you now can enjoy his presence living on the inside of you. And so I don't know if I'm going to get much further than the introduction, but again, I want to use this as something to teach you and to train you. And you just have to understand that when you walk out today, well, partially you'll be without excuse. You'll be without excuse because you'll have the tools and the things you need to go out and really help somebody make a difference in their life. But I want to share with you just an overview right quick. I don't have notes on this on the screen yet, but I want to give you a quick overview of the tabernacle. All right, now pay attention to what I'm about to say because it's going to show you that your preacher has not lost his mind in what I'm about to share with you, okay? Jesus told his disciples after his death and resurrection, that God's plan of salvation was foretold in the law of Moses. Now, it's important for you to write down this verse, Luke chapter 24 and verse 27. It says that he took two disciples, the men on the road to Emmaus, and he took them into the law, and he took them into the prophets, and he explained to them the things, listen, concerning himself. So again, I'm not crazy for what I'm about to share with you because Jesus told his men after his death that his plan of salvation was foretold in the law of Moses. The tabernacle, this thing right here, this whole deal in the front of your bulletin, this was an example of this. Now, Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 9, and I want you to write Hebrews 9 verse 9 down And I want you beside it to put a key verse, okay? Because I want to read it to you. Hebrews chapter 9, if you want to take your Bible and you can open there and you can go ahead and highlight that this morning. Hebrews chapter 9 verse 9. I'm I'm interested. I'd love to know how many of you even knew this verse existed and and was this. So, So here in the book of Hebrews, the writer has just been talking about this tabernacle, okay? He's been talking about it in chapter 9. You can look at verse 2. For a tabernacle was prepared. And it's talking about Exodus 25 when God said, Hey, Moses, I want, you to, I want you to build this place where I'm going to meet with humanity. Okay? With my people. And so that's verse 2. For a tabernacle was prepared. And so you can see the different parts there. And now I want you to hone in on verse 9. This is key. Again, just trying to make an argument for why I'm not losing my mind. Okay? So Jesus has already told his men, hey, the gospel was foretold. My plan of salvation was foretold in the law. So also in verse 9, it says this. It. Does anybody know what it refers to? The tabernacle. Good job. It, the tabernacle, was what? What does it say on the screen? It was symbolic. Now, it's interesting because do you know what the Greek word that's underneath the English word symbolic, do you know what the word, the Greek word is? And you have been with me this long and you do not know. It is the Greek word parable. Look it up. It's the Greek word parable. Matter of fact, it literally in the Greek spells parable. 
Same word used later when Jesus arrived on the earth and he spoke to them in parables. Same thing. You say, well, what, what is the significance of what you're trying to say? That it, the tabernacle, was, was symbolic, that it was a parable. What it means is that anytime Jesus gave a parable, listen, the story wasn't the point. The point was what that parable was ultimately pointing to. And so when you take the tabernacle, you understand this in, on the front of your bulletin wasn't the point. So what we have to ask ourselves is what was God using this tabernacle, what was he using it ultimately to point to? And I would say he's using it to point to Jesus and the good news and his plan of salvation of how to restore man into a right relationship with how to restore God's presence in their lives. Wow, this stuff is very exciting. Because, you know, especially when you go through something. See, I, I, I realize that I can't expect everybody this morning to be in my shoes. I can't expect you to, and I don't mean that in any way mean. But, you know, I've experienced this a lot in my life. But when you watch people breathe their last breath, it is a very humbling, sobering moment, y'all. Because here's what I know about everybody in this room. Every one of us is going to do the same thing. And you thinking you're prepared for that moment is not the same thing as being prepared. Because at that moment, when you breathe your last breath, sir, sir who is consumed with your work and nothing else in life, Sir, who is consumed with your hobbies, kids who are consumed with all these material things and all this worldly stuff. I'm just telling you out of great deep love for you, when you breathe your last, at that moment, it doesn't matter if you think you're prepared, sir or ma'am. Only thing that matters is, are you prepared? And what did you do when somebody shared with you how to be restored into a relationship with God and they shared that grace with you and they talked to you about Jesus? What did you do in that moment? It doesn't matter ultimately that you think you're okay. What matters is, are you really okay? And have you come to God on his terms, not yours? And that's what the tabernacle reveals is to these people is that you, there were terms God said, I want to dwell with you, but you're going to have to approach me on my terms, not yours. Am I making sense? So it's just, again, man, I, I, I'm not being mean with anybody here. It's just, boy, you just don't understand inside of me the passion and the, the fire that's burning and I look at you, and I realize some of you are tired. Some of you got all kinds of things going on. You're distracted. You got, you got different things. But I'm just telling you that for you, you better be prepared for this. And, and not only do you need to be prepared, but I'm just saying family, friends, loved ones, neighbors, all these people around us, it should be a concern of yours as a believer to wonder if they are prepared as well. Are you tracking me? It, it really should now. This is not one of those come in here, try to beat you up and all these different things. But I, I'm, I'm just telling you at that moment. Now, I, being in my position as a pastor and seeing these things over and over and over throughout the last 25 years, I mean, I have just, it's, it's so sobering because it just reminds me, man, this, I'm going to be there one day. But until that moment, I'm telling you, look at me, I'm going to give everything I got Everything I got, man, to, to seek to make this clear to this body and to those people out there. And I'm not, listen, I'm not asking you to do anything that I'm not doing. Do you understand that? I'm not asking you to take a message out here and share it with people that I'm not doing. Matter of fact, my father-in-law gave me more chances to witness to people in recent days than I've probably had in a long time. Just people wondering, man, how could such a, a good man, you know, get cancer and, and die and all these. I mean, man, you talk about opportunity. So I'm not asking you to do something I'm not willing to do. But the tab tabernacle, this, 
this arrangement that involved this priesthood, and I, I don't want to get all consumed with that. It had this sacrificial system. And this sacrificial system, this, 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 this slaying of animals and shedding their blood and then offering those animals as a substitute in place of the worshiper, listen, all these things pointed forward to its fulfillment of the meeting of God with humanity in the Lord Jesus Christ. Beginning in Exodus 25, and you, you can turn there if you want to because I want you to see this. told you, Andrew, I wouldn't get very far. But you do need to know Exodus 25 because that's when God gives the instructions. And man, I tell you, it's, ah. He told the people to gather an offering. He gave them specifically what he wanted the offering to be. And all of these things that were given were going to be used to build this particular structure. But it all kind of starts there. Well, it starts in the beginning of 25, but then it says in verse 8, now that he has all of the ingredients, so to speak, he says, and let them make me a sanctuary. A sanctuary, a place where I'm going to dwell So you can read about the instructions that God gave for for constructing this tabernacle, this place for him and man to meet together through a sacrificial system. What we do see is we see a holy God, a holy God who makes a way to meet with humans that are corrupted, that that are tainted by sin through this sacrificial system. Again, all pointing to his one and only final sacrifice, his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, who was perfect and, com- and the complete sacrifice, ultimately making it possible for us to meet with God and to be restored eternally to him. So write down with that statement, Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 24 through 27, and you can read that tonight when you get home. Hebrews chapter 9 Verse 24 through 27. So the tabernacle, again, as I've showed you, is, the, is in my mind this his horizontal like schematic of God's plan of salvation. So that's what we're wanting to dive into this morning. I want us to see the gospel in the tabernacle. And I want you to be trained. I want you to be equipped so that you will know this plan and be readily available to share it at any moment's time because over 25 years honestly when I've talked about evangelism a lot of times people don't want to openly admit this to me but they are struggling I'm just not sure what to say or how to explain things and so you want people to be clear and I'm telling you I believe God's given us a tool to equip us with this in the tabernacle so we're going to start with number one and we'll see how far we can get But number one, I want you to write this down. It all begins with God. So when we think about his plan of salvation, I want you to write down, it all begins with God. And to me, that's an important point because it doesn't begin with humanity. And do you understand why it doesn't begin with humanity? Because God declares that humanity now, because of sin, is dead. So explain to me, what can a dead man do? Nothing. What can a lost man do but be found? And so that's how the Bible describes us. And so I want you to understand this wonderful, glorious plan, this plan of hope, right, that we sing about, that we talk about, that we preach about, it all begins with God, and that is number one. So when you're, you're, you're thinking about sharing with someone and you're thinking about the tabernacle, you got to understand at this point, the people are running away from God. God had to step in and say, hey, I want you. I want to be with you. Come back, and here's a way to do that. I mean, do you know in Romans 3 that Paul even says, quoting out of the Old Testament, he highlights the fact that there's no one that's seeking after God. Did you realize that? It's like a lot of times I think we want to pat ourselves on the back for something, but God says, you, you weren't even seeking me. Because the truth of the gospel is you're not seeking him. Guess what? He's seeking you. Do you realize that? 
If you're saved here today, it's because, it's because he was running after you. He was seeking after you. He wanted you. So it all begins with God. You go back to the beginning, ladies and gentlemen. Everything was good, was it not? And the best part about Genesis 1 and 2, you know what it was? It was fellowship with God. It was being able to live in the presence of God without fear. That, that was the glory of it all. It was, it was the fellowship with God. But then in chapter 3 of Genesis, guess what happened? Sin entered. Sin being disobedience to God. Sin being, well, God said not to do this, but I'm convinced that I should do it. Sin entered, and then as a result of sin came what? What did God say? That if you eat, if you disobey me, what's going to happen? You will surely die. You will surely die. So sin, Genesis chapter 3, sin and death enter. Man is then exiled from the garden. And make this note real quick. Guess which direction man moves? He moves east. He moves east. And so we'll talk about that later. Just don't forget it. But after Genesis 3, man, according to Scripture, is described as a sinner. It's not that he becomes a sinner. Hear me, please. He's born a sinner. And so when I meet people all the time and I'm talking about the gospel with them, they think that they're unworthy of God because maybe they cheated on their wife or maybe, maybe they, they've not been a good father. You know, it's, and I'm like, man, it's deeper than that. Do you realize that? That's just a manifestation and a result of the fact that you are a sinner. And I think that's something we have got to help people understand that, that I'm not born okay and then I make a bad decision and then it becomes bad. No, I had two ultimately spiritually dead parents in Adam and Eve and everyone who's been born of them has been born into this world spiritually dead, separated from God because of that. We have to help people understand that. And see, my point here is that it all begins with God. So after Genesis 3, man is now a sinner who constantly falls short of the glory of God. The New Testament word for sin has the idea of missing the mark. That's the idea of the word. It's to miss the mark. And so, man, they're trying to hit it. But even in their best day, they still miss it. Even on their best Sunday, they still miss it. Are you hearing that? So I can't just look at somebody and say, well, they seem to be a good man. I think my father-in-law was a great man. But he was still a sinner that fell short of the glory of God that needed to be saved, just like everybody in this room. So man, according to Scripture, is a sinner who constantly falls short of the glory of God. And it's the same for all who have descended from Adam. And listen, that's you, that's me, that's the whole world. We're born into this world as sinners who fall short of the glory of God. We can't, we can't hit that mark. There's nothing I can do to save myself. There's nothing I can do to make myself alive from being dead. Or There's nothing I can do to find myself. That has to be done for me. I need to be rescued. And oh, how sad it would be. Would it not be so sad if that's where the story ended? I would not be standing here today if that's where the story ended. Would you? Man, I'd be out here in the world. I would be trying to get everything in the world I could get because if this is all there is, I'm going to get everything I can of it. But I know it's not what the, that's, I know it's not all there is. So how sad would it be if it ended here? You see, the plan of salvation is all about God because I've just described what God says about us. So it's not about us because we're in no position to fix it. The story now becomes all about him. God is the hero. So when you think about the plan of salvation, we just need to convey to people, hey man, God is the hero. He's the rescuer. He's the deliverer. He's the one that's going to take you from this spiritual plight and put you in a whole different spiritual position, which is one of light and life and hope. 
How awesome is that? So number one, it all begins with God. So when you're presenting the gospel to people, where does it start for you? It better start with him. Because from beginning to end, the focus is totally and solely about him. This is the last thing we'll talk about today. Number two. Because here's what I want to say before I say number two. I just want you to get that in spite of man, Exodus chapter 25, verse 8. It says, let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. My point is to just simply say the tabernacle was not man's idea. It wasn't. Man's doing his own thing. Running his own life, his own direction, trying to figure it out. So God is the one that said, make this. It originated with him. So everything originates with him. And secondly, I just want to talk to you for a moment about God's love for the world. Number two, God's love for the world. Write down Ephesians chapter 2, if you will. But I want to read to you Ephesians chapter 2. And I want us to listen to the words Paul uses or the words that the Holy Spirit gives Paul to speak. And so, of course, Paul's writing a letter to the church. And so in verse 1, he begins with saying, And you, church, there was a time when you were dead in your trespasses and sins. And then he goes on with a more detailed description of what it was like. But then I want you to notice verse 4 in chapter 2 of Ephesians. There's a phrase here. What's the phrase? But God. The phrase is but God. So you were dead. You were bound by your selfish desires. You were by nature a child of wrath. You were all these things, but God. And I want you to listen to those, the rest of it. But God who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us even when we were dead in trespasses has made us alive together with Christ. So it was God who gave his son. So God's love for the world. You see, when we're talking to people about the gospel, we are declaring, yes, it all originates with God. But what we're declaring is that God loves the world. And even though we are dead, even though we are lost, even though we are bound for God's wrath, and even though that in this person that sin may show up this way, and even though in that one it may show up in that way, it doesn't matter. God's love is greater. And I want you to just go back just in your mind with me to Exodus 25 and verse 8. He said, I want you to make this sanctuary. And did you see why? Because I want to dwell with my people. You hear it? Man, that's the love of God. The tabernacle is declaring forth the love of God for humanity, for the world. I want to fellowship with them. I want this relationship to be restored because Exodus 25 verse 8 states the purpose of that tabernacle, which ultimately states the purpose of Jesus that we read about in John chapter 1, who literally the word is used, who tabernacled among us on this earth. John chapter 1 verse 1 says this, in the beginning was the word. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. He, Jesus, was with God in the beginning. And then you skip down to verse 14, and here's what it says. And the Word, Jesus, became flesh and literally tabernacled among us. So in the same way God put that tabernacle on earth to bring man back into fellowship with him, it was only temporary. It could never fully do that. But let me tell you something. Jesus did. He came and fulfilled this. His life was the perfect sacrifice, the once for all, that was to bring us back into that relationship with God permanently to restore God's presence in us. So the tabernacle declares forth the love of God because what does it say in John 3, 16? For God so loved the world that he gave his son. He put his son here to make a way back to him. So just like God put a physical tabernacle on earth to fellowship with humanity, this foreshadowed Jesus who would come and restore man's relationship with God. 
You know what the tabernacle says? You know what this says? And you've got it in your mind and you're sitting there talking to somebody who doesn't have a relationship with God. You've got it in your mind. You know what you're able to say to them? God wants you. God wants a relationship with you. God's saying, I want to be with you. I want to dwell in you. I want you to be in relationship with me, for you to walk with me. I want to restore everything as it was intended to be in the beginning. And so God is demonstrating his love that in spite of sin, he's providing a way back to him. You see, and if you look at this, if you look at this drawing horizontally on the back of your bulletin, you see, man is outside. He's outside of this, this fence that you can see it with the little dots in it. That's the fence. See, man's out here. And so God provides this way to go into this entrance over here by the sermon notes where you see the gate to come all the way through here to eventually end here. Which again, what was the point of it all? It's his presence. It's so that he would dwell. See, that's where, that's what it's all about. It's not even just about you being able to die and go to heaven. It's about God coming to dwell in you right now. So everything originates with him. It starts with him. We're in no position to do anything about it. People need to understand that because what is the natural thing that man does? See, we live in a world, do good, get good, do bad, get bad. That's the world we live in. You go out every day. You work your you're behind off to get money so that you're able to provide. And it's hard to understand, to take it out of the culture and realize God's not asking you to work and do anything. What God's doing is he's declaring to you that the work has already been done. Just come in and receive my presence that I want to give to you as a gift. Amen? Amen. So what an amazing truth. I had the opportunity last week. Young lady came up and said, I don't know how to be saved. Would you tell me how to be saved? And it was just their moment, man. That's all I can tell you. It's as they, you, you, you're talking about these things, and, man, you just see their eyes light up. Like, have you ever seen somebody, like, they get it? And they're like, hmm. And they're getting it, and their eyes are being opened, and God is performing that miracle. Man, there's no greater thing to realize that God is just inviting you to receive what's already been done. Life is a gift. Real life is a gift. Heaven is a gift. Eternal life is a gift from God that's already been bought and paid for by Jesus. I can't help but wonder this morning, has this word touched you in some way, somehow? Man, maybe it's your day. And maybe you're sitting there and you're just, you're constantly living in doubt. You're constantly living in, well, you know, I'm, I'm sitting in the pew and I'm here, and, but I just don't really have that peace that I'm in a right relationship with God. I'm just not sure. Man, I just want to encourage you. Don't live with that. Don't be okay with that. Because I promise you, and God ultimately can see my heart today, and he knows if I'm telling you the truth or not. I do not live with a single ounce of doubt. I don't live with it, man. I've come to the point in my life where I'm banking everything on what this says. And if it says what it says, it says all who come to him and by faith, whoever believes on the Lord Jesus Christ shall be saved. And so my hope completely is in him. So if the Bible's wrong and Jesus is not enough, then I'm in deep trouble, okay? I'm in deep trouble. But I know I'm not. I know I'm not. So maybe it's the day's the day that you need to have that transference of your faith in believing that you can do it and to begin trusting that he's already done it. That he's already done it. You receive the gift. You receive the restoration that he wants to bring in your life. And not only that, but you're important today. And I hope that those of you that are believers here will pray for them that are struggling with that. But here's the second thing I got to challenge you with. And I'm dead serious with this church. It is a disgrace and it is a shame if Matt Rummage is willing to come into this building and stand in this pulpit and proclaim this message of hope and salvation to you, but he won't go out there and tell anybody. 
And I apologize really deeply if that offends you and sets you in a bad place with me, but I'm just being honest with you. Because there are a whole lot of things that we are tied up with and tripped up over when it comes to Christianity. And yet here we are, man. We have have the gospel message of Jesus Christ to tell people how to be restored in a relationship. What are we doing with it? So this is not a message to try to manipulate you. It's a message to just shake you. Because y'all know in life, sometimes we just get off track. Sometimes we just need to come back to what it's really all about and recommit ourselves to the mission. And a big part of this mission in building disciples is being able to proclaim the good news. Because not everybody you meet is going to be in a relationship with God, and you're going to have to show them how to have that. And that excites me to know that some of you will take this seriously. Because I have over 25 years, man, I hear this all the time. Well, preacher's never done this or never done that or it's never... I've got my notes to prove it. <laughs> so I, I'm sorry, but, but you get to God and you start complaining and he's going to break out a computer and he's going to, you're going to say, Matt Rummage sermon files. Oh, oh, good gracious. Well, maybe I wasn't there that day, you know. Or, or, well, they recorded it. They did. I mean, so, uh, you, what are you going to do then? So here's my thing. If you're here today and you're not saved, man, find me, please, and let's talk. There's no use to live another day, another moment of your life living in doubt and not having assurance. So please find me. Find Andrew. Let's talk. But secondly, Christian, I'm asking you to make a bold stand today. Let's stop stinking it up. Let's let's stop focusing on the non-essentials and let's just return to the mission. Let's do it. Let's say as believers... Today I'm making a commitment. I'm going to walk out of those doors today. And it's not that I'm asking you to go stir something up. I'm just asking you to make a commitment to the mission and say, God, I'm here. Whoever you put in my path, wherever they are, I'm going to meet them there. And I want to help them move forward to become a true disciple of Jesus Christ. Would you bow your heads with me this morning as we leave? I'm going to ask you to make a bold step today. I know this is always challenging to, to everybody, but, but man, if you're a believer here today and you just say, hey, man, preacher, I've, I've really gotten off track, lost sight of the mission, can't even really remember the last time I've shared the gospel with anybody. Can't even remember the last time I even attempted to show someone how to have a right relationship with you. But you know what, preacher, I appreciate the message today. I appreciate your words. I appreciate the challenge. I want to make a commitment today. I'm going to draw a line in the sand as a believer. I want to get back in the game. I want to get back into what matters. If you're here and you're willing to say that, I want you just to stand up. Would you stand up? I know it's a bold stand, and I know it is saying a lot. I want to challenge you senior adults, man. Don't don't coast across the finish line. There's never a time, senior, that you get to retire from the mission. You still have a voice. You still have the ability to bow on your knees and pray. But Father, before we close this morning, I want to lift up everyone who's standing and even those who maybe were scared to stand for whatever reason. And I want to just pray, God, that they will understand that you have given them your spirit. And you told us in your word, you told those early believers, you said, hey, wait. Before you step out in this mission, I'm going to give you a gift. I'm going to fulfill a promise. I'm going to give you the gift of myself, my presence, my life, and he's going to go with you. And he's going to fill you. And as he fills you and as you allow him to fill you, you're going to become a person that you could never be in your flesh. You're going to become bold and you're going to to become a, a voice of mine. 
So I just pray that they understand they are not alone. That when they step out in this world with family members, with neighbors, with friends, with co-workers and all this, that they have you and your presence and that you will provide everything that is needed for this journey, for this mission, God. I thank you for those who are already in the game, who have been faithfully in the game for a good while. I just pray you continue to bless them as they engage in the mission. But I pray especially for these here today who are drawing that line in the sand, God, I pray. And I'm excited, God, I'm excited to hear as we begin sowing those seeds once again into the hearts of men and women. I'm excited to hear all the wonderful things that you are going to do and plan to do. So, God, I love you. And I do want to close this prayer by praying for that soul here that's not saved. And I want to pray that before they leave, they would find someone and at least be honest and say, help me. Help me understand the rest of this plan of salvation so that I can know God and be restored in my relationship with him. So, God, bless them now. And, Lord, thank you, Lord, for your presence. And we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen.